Thanks, Tony. That's a very kind uh, introduction. And uh, thanks, Tony and John, for the invitation to be part of this uh, terrific session looking at uh, the question of combinations of immunotherapies and, and RAF inhibitors. And I hope to sort of elaborate on some of the uh, great presentations already um, um, already discussed here, Tony's work and Jennifer's work, and, and perhaps add some complementary uh, data to, to what has already been reviewed. And I'll underscore what um, many others at this meeting have already uh, stated, which is that really the landscape for treatment with melanoma was transformed a couple of years ago, and uh, the FDA approval of these two drugs, ipilimumab and vemurafenib in 2011, really set the stage for uh, two broad areas that have um, uh, been uh, part of this transformation. Uh, on the left, uh, looking at uh, immunotherapies like checkpoint inhibitors, ipilimumab being the first probably of many, uh, and then on the right, vemurafenib as uh, an example of the targeted inhibitors now joined by dibrafenib and trametinib that are so important uh, to treating this disease. There's a clear rationale for combining these two modalities which have complementary mechanisms of action, and it's long been thought that this might be a strategy to address some of the shortcomings of each of these agents, specifically to address the emergence of resistance to targeted inhibitors, and as a strategy to uh, address the low response rates typical for checkpoint blockade. And the hope, was, hope is that combination therapies may achieve uh, longer durable responses. But of course, uh, as Tony alluded to earlier, uh, and as this audience is well aware, we also have to be vigilant for toxicities. And um, a recent um, publication in the New England Journal certainly highlighted that when a phase one study combining ipilimumab and vemurafenib closed early because of hepatotoxicity, raising the question uh, as to whether um, these two modalities can be safely combined. And I think that's still an outstanding question. Uh, there's certainly... Um, room to consider schedules uh, and to better understand the mechanisms of these toxicities, which may well be due to uh, immune activation or maybe potentiation of tissue-specific injury. And the question, I think, is also still outstanding whether this is a, a drug-specific versus class effect and whether alternative combinations with uh, targeted inhibitors and PD-1 blocking agents or other targeted inhibitors might be more successful. Uh, the last couple years have certainly taught us that uh, BRAF inhibitors do alter the landscape of the tumor immune response, and uh, what I've shown here is, is one way to look at how BRAF inhibitors can affect the immune system, and I have sort of a Venn diagram uh, of the tumor and the immune system and uh, the two extensively overlapping, and there's quite a bit of um, recent work uh, looking at how uh, the microenvironment and the immune microenvironment in the tumor clearly is altered in patients who are treated with RAF inhibitors, whether that's tumor antigen expression or cytokines as part of the microenvironment that uh, Jennifer uh, reviewed in her talk earlier. Um, there's also evidence of uh, modulation of PDL1. And then there are also some um, work that's been done looking either in vitro or in vivo more directly at how these RAF inhibitors uh, affect T cells and giving us some specific information, specific, including that RAF inhibitors are not directly T cell cytotoxic and don't uh, appear to impair T cell function, which was reassuring when thinking about the combination, and can increase cytotoxicity in some cytokine production. And the majority of my talk is going to focus on expanding uh, our understanding of the direct effect that RAF inhibitors have on uh, T cells, uh, looking at their activation, proliferation, and signaling. Uh, when I began this work um, a couple of years ago, we had some really specific questions about how RAF inhibitors impact uh, T cell activation and started with an in vitro model. Um, and we started using... Um, a couple of drugs, PLX4720 is a, a very similar reagent to vemurafenib that was available to us in the lab. And we used a second drug, which is a pan-RAF inhibitor, XL281, which was also available to us and uh, one that we were interested in because we participated in a combination study combining ipilimumab and this pan-RAF inhibitor that I will um, make mention of later in the talk. 
And so our model system in vitro is relatively simple. Uh, essentially, we cultured T cells, uh, in this uh, case, uh, human T cells, and in some later experiments, mouse T cells, um, stimulated them with anti-CD3 or anti-CD3 and CD28 antibodies in the presence or absence of inhibitors, and evaluated T cell activation in the typical ways, looking at proliferation and upregulation act of activation markers, as well as cytokine production. And when we do this uh, experiment here, uh, shown with the human T cell uh, line jerket cells, and the cells are not uh, stimulated, you see very little upregulation here looking at the activation marker CD69 as a convenient activation marker. When these cells are activated with anti-CD3, they upregulate CD69 as we would expect. But one of the things that we noticed in these experiments is that cells exposed to the highest uh, concentrations of the RAF inhibitor had inhibited activation, whereas those uh, in the mid-level range actually had enhanced activation. Uh, looking at this particular activation marker as well as a panel of others that I won't show for brevity. And these are, um, these conditions overlap with conditions that inhibit uh, melanoma tumor cell growth. So there's sort of an overlapping range where you can get T cell activation and uh, tumor inhibition. And this is true both for the PANRAF inhibitor on the left, as well as the um, more targeted agent PLX4720 on the right. Similar pattern and similar effect on the tumor cells. And uh, in addition, for brevity, I'll summarize some of our other observations. So in addition to looking at CD69, we looked at a panel of other activation markers, including PD-1, ICOS, CD25, and see a similar uh, pattern. We also looked at T cell proliferation and KI67 expression, as well as cytokine production. We found that this uh, phenomenon held regardless of whether we activated the T cells with anti-CD3 antibody or more specifically in an antigen-specific fashion using peptide-pulsed APCs. And this, uh, as uh, Jennifer has published on, uh, stood in contrast to our experience with the MEK inhibitors, um, which were in, uh, did not have this activating effect and were uniformly inhibitory. And so we thought about what mechanisms might explain this uh, enhanced activation. And much uh, as uh, Tony alluded to before, we came to a similar uh, conclusion that the most interesting place to look at this would be in thinking about paradoxical activation. And here is a cartoon uh, sort of going through what is known about paradoxical activation from work done on tumor cells and understanding um, the effect that these agents have on squamous cell cancers and uh, keratic canthomas, as well as RAF wild uh, type tumor cells. And at lowest, at the lowest doses of RAF inhibitor, uh, what we see is low signaling through the uh, pathway. But um, in the presence of drug, you can actually see that there is um, transactivation of the RAF dimers that leads to uh, paradoxically high activation of the MAP kinase pathway. Whereas in saturating um, conditions where the drug is uh, present and can inhibit every RAF molecule shown on the far right, you can block the pathway. And so we wondered whether this uh, pattern of paradoxical activation, which held, holds true for BRAF wild type tumors as well as squamous cell cancers, might also hold true for T cells. And in order to test this, we set up a model system um, where we could use a flow based assay to look at uh, ERK uh, phosphorylation in T cells uh, stimulated with the anti CD3 antibody. And what we we're able to, are able to detect using specific antibodies is the presence of phosphorylated versus unphosphorylated ERK. And in minutes after T cell activation, you see a big spike in phospho ERK um, reflecting signaling through this pathway. And if we look at this using a flow-based assay in the lower left corner here, um, you see a big jump in the uh, fluorescence staining of these cells within the first few minutes, which returns to baseline after about 60 minutes, and this is uh, very similar to what we see if we do Western blotting rather than the flow-based assay, uh, whereas um, the total ERK, uh, total MEK uh, are stable over this period of time. And this allows us to evaluate 
uh, singling on a single cell level and do, get a better idea of the heterogeneity and look at subpopulations of immune cells. And so if we go back to the initial observation that there's a window where these cells appear to be hyperactivated and ask what's going on with signaling during this uh, window of time, we did a couple of experiments where we took cells and exposed them to titrated amounts of the RAF inhibitor. And here, for clarity, I've divided our titrations into uh, two um, groups. The highest dose is going up to 20 micromolar. Uh, are shown in this first panel where you can clearly see that the 20 micromolar dose, which had been inhibitory to our activation markers, also inhibits signaling through ERK, and this is most pronounced uh, at the early time points. Whereas as we start to get into the lower doses and more clearly seen as we get into um, these middle and much lower doses, at later time points there's a sustained uh, activation of phospho work, which seems to hang around uh, much longer than we found in the absence of drug. And if we take a snapshot in time and plot this out in a bar graph, um, you once again can see that uh, comparing the phospho work in black bars to the total work in the gray bars, uh, there's a titratable uh, effect where there's hyperactivation of the pathway in this middle level of um, drug exposure. And here are a couple of flow plots that also give you an idea about how, uh, how these data look. Another way to look at this is uh, by uh, Western blotting, and uh, here we've compared the flow-based assay to our Western uh, blotting approach and see the uh, same results in this case uh, with the PLX drug in these middle uh, doses of the PLX drug, you can see enhanced uh, phospho ERK compared to uh, cells treated with the vehicle control, and this is uh, inhibited at the highest doses of the drug. And we can actually compare these two drugs and see a slightly different dose profile that actually recapitulates what we saw in terms of the activation markers like CD69, and a slightly different uh, magnitude of effect between these two drugs. And um, this was a starting point in terms of our work uh, looking in vitro, but we were much more interested in how this might uh, impact how T cells are activated in vivo. And again, uh, keeping in mind that this is simply one slice of the pie, uh, and we're, we're keeping a somewhat myopic view on the T cell uh, effect, we decided on uh, using a model system of uh, the OT1, where uh, mice are adoptively transferred with OT1 cells, which uh, recognize an ovalbumin peptide. They're immunized with ovalbumin, which expands in an antigen-specific fashion these transgenic T cells. And these mice were treated with the RAF inhibitor or CTLA-4 blockade or a combination of both. These mice don't have tumors. We're not looking at the effect of BRAF inhibitors on tumor. We're simply looking at how they affect T cells. Uh, and if we do that, uh, the first bar represents mice immunized with ovalbumin and the expansion uh, five days later of these OT1 T cells uh, without either of the drugs on board. If we uh, give the mice either of two different systemic doses of the RAF inhibitor, you can see that we can boost this expansion of these antigen-specific T cells. Uh, if we give the mice CTLA-4 blockade, we can also uh, modestly boost uh, the expansion of these cells, but the combination of both together has the most profound effect in terms of uh, expansion in this model system. Uh, we wanted to then uh, sort of follow up and ask, again, in a, a model system, how are our T cells signaling? And here we're going to employ the same uh, assay, flow-based assay, looking at phosphorylated ERK uh, to look specifically at our T cells. Here we treated mice systemically with RAF inhibitor and then sacked them uh, five days into their treatment and ex vivo stimulated them with anti-CD3 uh, within minutes of coming out of the mice and looked at their ability to signal through the MAP kinase pathway. Um, and so here uh, we've looked at both CD8 and CD4 T cells, and the ex vivo stimulation is represented by the minuses and the pluses, uh, plus uh, are the stimulated cells. And so you can see uh, the mice um, 
that were untreated certainly have a little bit of activation uh, in the presence of anti-CD3, which we'd expect, but those mice exposed to the RAF inhibitor have a much bigger jump in terms of act, uh, the activatability, for lack of a better word, of their T cells ex vivo. Um, so um, moving on to um, a system that looks more uh, globally at um, uh, the tumor the potential for anti-tumor effects. Um, the next set of experiments are experiments that we designed specifically to look at how uh, this effect of the RAF inhibitors on T cells might affect the anti-tumor um, activity of CTLA-4 blockade. And one thing that I should mention specifically is that the uh, tumors that we chose for these experiments, SIAN1, a fibrosarcoma, and CT26, a colorectal carcinoma, are not BRAF mutant. And so I'll, I'll draw your attention to uh, the fact that the RAF inhibitors have uh, little direct anti-tumor effect in this model, in these models. And that was our intention, was to choose tumors where the direct anti-tumor effect would be relatively modest, so we could try to isolate the effect. Uh, that these drugs might be having on the uh, T cell mediated effect of CTLA-4 blockade. Uh, the top left corner for both of these panels represents the control. Untreated mice, the bottom left, the RAF inhibitor alone, uh, the top right, CTLA-4 blockade alone, and the bottom left combination of both of the drugs. And you can see uh, in both uh, model systems and uh, in both in the cases of uh, concomitant as well as sequential therapy, we were able to get a better effect with the combination of both of these drugs. Uh, the last thing I'll touch on really very briefly, um, because I, I don't have anything more than anecdotal to sh data to share, um, is um, a question that Jennifer or a, a, an idea that Jennifer alluded to in her earlier talk, which is how can we get the most out of these clinical trials, many of which are ongoing, and what sort of monitoring can we uh, do to best understand uh, all of the dynamic effects? Um, and one of the ideas that occurred to us in uh, doing these studies was that this uh, phosphoflow assay, or this flow-based assay to look at T-cell uh, signaling might be uh, a, an approach we could take in terms of monitoring patients. And so this is data from a trial we had open briefly at Memorial combining the RAF inhibitor BMS908662, also known as XL281, with ipilimumab. Uh, it was a short-lived study and was re replaced by the um, vemurafenib ipilimumab study. Um, and so we only had two patients to look into, but for simply the um, uh, opportunity to see if this was feasible, we collected peripheral blood samples on these patients and used this as an opportunity to look at the NAP kinase signaling by looking at phospho-ERK or total ERK, as well as uh, proliferation markers like KA67 that had shown up in our earlier in vitro studies. Uh, we chose three time points, uh, pre-treatment after the RAF inhibitor alone or after the combination of both uh, drugs and looked at either phospho ERK or total ERK, which I've um, not shown here, uh, KI6 and KI67 in each of these two patients for both CD4 and CD8 cells. These are the CD4 cells. Um, and we were able to uh, at least feasibly detect phosphoric ex vivo in uh, re-stimulated uh, peripheral blood cells. And I'd say more convincingly, we were able to see a jump in KI67, which was clearly the most profound when both drugs were on board. There are, of course, limitations uh, to this, as the study was not in any way um, a controlled study, and we don't have an a adequate comparator of patients treated with ipilimumab alone. So some of the initial um, conclusions that we drew from these studies were that RAF inhibitors may uh, potentiate or inhibit T cell activation in vitro or in vivo. Uh, at the doses that we've used in our mouse models, uh, these appear to have predominantly activating effects, and I'd say that seems to be true as well from the small number of patient samples we've collected and would be consistent with uh, most of the other uh, work uh, on uh, the topic of these combinations. Um, the combination of RAF inhibitors with checkpoint blockade has been promising in preclinical models, but clearly we've seen that there may be some roadblocks to implementing this in patients. 
uh, and um, T cell signaling potential may be a parameter to consider for uh, monitoring as some of these future studies move forward. Um, so the future directions that we have in mind, of course, are starting to look beyond RAF inhibitors. Uh, MEK inhibitors clearly are different than RAF inhibitors, and how this integrates into the sum total of anti-tumor effect, I think, is something we're still working to understand. And then, of course, as targeted inhibitors and um, checkpoint blockade both move outside of the world of melanoma, there are lots of other uh, combinations um, to look into. Um, we've had a rather myopic view on CD4 and CD8 T cells based on their importance in checkpoint blockade, but obviously uh, the tumor microenvironment has many other cells of interest, and the uh, effect that these agents have on monocytes, macrophages, regulatory T cells, MDSC are, are something that we're still uh, keen to understand. Um, and in addition, and, and as a sort of closing slide, I'll, I'll show you a, sort of schema of the sort of work we've been doing to develop further this phosphoflow assay as an uh, immune um, uh, biomarker. Um, here's a panel of healthy donors, again, uh, activated ex vivo, uh, their CD4 uh, T cells activated ex vivo and looking at phospho ERK levels. And um, the idea that we would have in mind would be that as patients are treated with novel targeted inhibitors, this would offer us an opportunity to understand how uh, signaling through this pathway is modulated in the presence of inhibitor and make some predictions about uh, toxicity and activity of the combinations. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to take questions after acknowledging um, the uh, w importance of my mentor, Jed Wolchak, who uh, uh, gave me some great leader ship and advice in uh, developing this project as well as the other members of our laboratory and our collaborations with the Rosen and Allison Laboratory. <laughs>